population estimation, abundance estimation, and that kind of stuff because I'm mm-hmm. more inclined towards quantitative ecology. Uh, subsequently, Ravi, uh, whom you already heard, uh, left the institute to join the UNDP, and I took over uh, the Lion Research in Gir. Subsequently, so I started working in 1995. But what I'm going to synthesize with Lions, 1995 with Lions, but I'm going to synthesize the long-term research project that we've done since 2006 to 2019. So that's that's what I'm going to talk about today. Okay. Uh, so as as you all know, this is the range of the Asiatic lion, and it ranged all the way from northern Africa on the the shorelines of the Mediterranean Sea, the Atlas Mountains into Persia, and then into India. So this this uh, region of Iraq, Iran, and the part of Afghanistan which you see, uh, lions were there till very recent times, and and this part of India, into Pakistan, uh, the last century had lions there to the seventh century, seventeenth century, but subsequently they all were exterminated due to hunting. The distribution of lions in India, I think that it's believed that they came into India much later than humans uh, came into India, and uh, well th- there are. Uh, you don't see evidence of lions in the Indus Valley civilization uh, records. Very, you don't see evidence of lions even the, in the Bimbetka paintings. So tigers were present, but uh, lions are believed to have entered India much later uh, than any of the other animals which came into India. So that let many people believe that they were actually introduced into India. There were books written by people calling them exotic aliens. Uh, lions and cheetahs came, you know, were brought in and by people and introduced in India. But uh, if you see uh, that this is just a myth, it's somebody's uh, beliefs. Uh, it's not true because many of the Ethiopian fauna which you have in India has come in from the African realm. Lions and African uh, uh, lions and cheetahs being part of the Ethiopian fauna which you get in India, including the caracal, the striped hyena, the leopard. All of them have come in from the Ethiopian realm, the African realm. And this is a full genome, uh, not my work. This has been recently published. But I thought it is important to show you, people, that uh, lions in India are not exotic aliens, but very much uh, part and parcel of the fauna of India. They have come to India naturally. And if you look at this uh, full genome sequence of uh, lions, extinct and extant lions, and look at the evolutionary uh, history of lions, what you see is the Asiatic lions forming a clade. With the West African and the North African lions, while the African, uh, the other African lions, which are South African and East African lions, form a separate clade. The IUCN has now also changed the nomenclature of uh, the Asiatic lions, which was initially Panthera leo persica, uh, to Panthera leo leo, and the other lions being something else, as a different subspecies. And here you see the evolutionary tree of lions, and the Indian samples fall very much in the Asian samples. They're very different and distinct from the East African population through which um, if at all lions were introduced in India they would have come from the East African area because we had a lot of slave trade going on between Tanzania and this part of India, the Nawab of Junagadh and so on and so forth. So this is just a myth. Lions are very much a part and parcel of Indian fauna as uh, the tiger is and we'll go on from there. So the lions have survived in India due to the efforts of uh, the Nawabs of Junagadh who ruled this area, this this region of Gir in the Saurashtra came under the jurisdiction of three different states uh, Baroda under the Gayakwads, the Bhavnagar states, the Gohilwad, this part of Gir was belonging to them and the majority of the Gir belonged to the Nawab of Junagadh and uh, it, it was sort of a pride for him to protect the lions from hunting and history tells the records of uh, even when the Viceroy of India came to hunt lions here uh, he saw the Nawab's reluctance to allow him to hunt and he didn't hunt and that's how conservation of lions began way back in the 18th century. And here you see the people who are responsible, the, the different Nawabs. Uh, this is the principal of um, Rajkumar College and uh, Maharaj Kumar Dharmakumar uh, Dharma Singh, the Prince of Bhavnagar. Uh, they led the first lion census which was done in Gir uh, and they evolved the Padma census technique actually which was then adopted for tigers by Sarojarai Chaudhary. So it were the shikaris of uh, Gir who actually used to track lions based on the pugmarks and not tigers. Tigers came in much later. So um, at the time when the Nawab left um, for Pakistan uh, due to the partition, there were close to about 50 lions left uh, in India. And this was a bottleneck when the best uh, hunting, I mean the maximum hunting 
had taken its toll. It's believed anywhere between 50, 20 to 50 lions survived in Gir and occupying very little area. And today, these lions have expanded to cover an agro-pastoral landscape outside of the protected area in the landscape of Saurashtra, which covers close to about 12,000 square kilometers. So the protected area here, uh, in reality, is only 250 square kilometers, which is the heart of this Gir PA uh, National Park. The rest of it being sanctuary area. Sanctuary has the status of having a conservation objective, but also allows people to share the habitat with wildlife. So there are people living inside this protected area of Gir, uh, the Maldharis, and we will see how people and lions coexist in this landscape. Having a lion as a neighbor is not the best thing to have, but people have been extremely tolerant of lions, and I'll explain to you how this coexistence happens in the Saurashtra landscape. So first of all, uh, unfortunately, li lions don't have the stripe patterns of tigers. So identifying lions is uh, much more difficult, especially if you want to take a proper assessment of their numbers and their stages. We have to find a way to individually identify them. So there was a technique which was developed uh, in the 60s by Rudnai and Penniquick in Africa, which we adapted to the Asiatic lion. It works very well. Uh, the Rudnai and Penniquick uh, technique look, relied on whisker patterns, which are unique to every individual lions. They referred to two rows of whiskers. And what I have taken it ahead is looking at three rows of whiskers, A, B and C. And the spots on these whiskers are unique for each lion. So whenever a lion is sighted, uh, this kind of form is filled in, calibrating the whiskers on a graph paper. And this gives you an individual identity of a lion which is then put into a software program which is readily uh, which is easy, uh, it's a free access software on our website you can download it it's called program lion which allows you to identify in unique individuals allow them to do reciting and output a matrix in the form of a capture mark recapture analysis metrics which you can export into mark or specially explicit programs like density or in r and uh, do your analysis for density uh, estimation of uh, lions most carnivores, when you approach them, when they see a human being, uh, they non-aggressively show their teeth by yawning. And when they yawn, if you are good at photography, you can take pictures and you can age the carnivores based on the, uh, the pattern of tooth wear and tooth eruption. And you can tell the age of lions and you can identify about seven age groups, which I'll talk to you a little while later. So this is how lion, uh, lion fingerprinting happens. Uh, the lions are identified based on the whiskers and permanent body marks and this goes into a software program and you can then do uh, specially explicit density estimates as has been done here uh, uh, over here and we've been doing this mark recapture estimates of lions across the landscape. Unfortunately the Gujarat government has never allowed us to do a proper census because lion numbers are extremely political and the reported figures are, um, I would call them political populations because you don't know what the reality is and they are uh, uh, caters to the what is required to be shown uh, to the outer world of what lion numbers are in the deer landscape. They could be anywhere between 300 lions to 1000 lions uh, today in the landscape of deer uh, and the Saurashtra landscape. So I've had the opportunity and the permissions to um, uh, capture and radio call alliance. I've been working with them for the last 25 years or so. And uh, over the tenure, I've radio followed about 35 individual lions and monitored about uh, another 120 odd lions through the uh, whisker identification and you know kept record of their life histories uh, when they you know when they were born, how they lived when they died, whom they mated with and so on and so forth. So long-term data has been recorded on lion ecology. It's probably one of the long-term projects in India, which is ongoing for the past uh, several years. In fact, the Wildlife Institute has had a presence in Gir right from the mid 80s all the way till today. Uh, so it's, it's the longest ongoing project in wildlife ecology in, in, the, in the country. So, um, as I said, you could identify lions into six age categories and just like we did with tigers and actually we evolved this technique with lions first and then we exported it to tigers, it works very well. And you can tell these age groups apart um, uh, by looking at their tooth eruption, the scowl of the jaw and the pigmentation on the nose, so on and so forth. So once you have this, you can estimate uh, their uh, uh, parameters of demography, that is uh, density, sex ratio, interbirth interval, age at first reproduction, <laughs> litter sizes, 
and do known faith models to look at survivorship. So what we found is the density of lions in, in, the, in the tourism zone is uh, we were expecting that it will be highly correlated with lion prey which is chital density and samba density which we also have estimated across gear. This is the tourism zone of gear and what you see here in the color coding is density of their primary prey that is chital and their preferred prey which is samba which you see the contours here depict lion density. So the density of lions do not coincide well with the spatial density of either chital or samba. But if you were to superimpose them on mating sites where lions are baited to attract tourists, I mean to attract lions to show them to tourists, you see that there is an exact um, overlap especially of where lions are and where they are baited. So when their lions have assured a food source at a certain place, they aggregate and their densities remain high in uh, tourism hotspots which are the baiting sites to show lions to tourists. So this actually disrupts uh, the carnivores uh, normal distribution pattern and there is high density of lions in certain areas where ecologically they may not be sustained due to their natural prey. So lion densities range anywhere, anywhere in the larger landscape of about 2 lions per 100 square kilometers to a maximum of about 16 lions per 100 square kilometers within the uh, gear protected area. Uh, just skip this. So the average uh, uh, litter size of um, lions is about two to three um, cubs in a litter. Uh, the interbirth interval is about 1.5 years, which you can see 1.37 years. Um, and the first age of littering is about four, four and a half years. When a lion is about four and four and a half years, she gives birth to her first litter. So this is uh, about demography. You look at survival um, from cub stage to juvenile stage, that is one to two years. Uh, these are the sample sizes we have and these are the uh, mortality rates and the causes of mortality. Infanticide, that is males killing cubs is a very common occurrence in many carnivores, especially in lions and it occurs when new males take over a pride, they kill all the cubs which have been sired by their uh, other group of lions which they have ousted. So this is to bring the females into estrus. And once the females into, come into estrus, the new lions, the new males who have taken over the territory can do the mating and uh, propagate their own progeny. So this infanticide is a very important cause of mortality to regulate populations of lions and many other carnivores. So the total survival rates of uh, males and females, males have lower survival compared to adult females. And this allows us to compare the demographic parameters of uh, gear lions with those of uh, African lions. And gear lions, as I told you earlier, have come from a very small population, anywhere from 20 to 50 lions. So they're highly inbred. And because of that inbreeding, you would expect that um, if this inbreeding were to manifest itself, then you would have inbreeding depression. And the uh, demographic parameters of uh, Asiatic lions would have been depressed. That is their survivorship, their uh, uh, cub survival, um, the litter sizes, so on and so forth. But what you see here is that the demographic parameters of Asiatic lions are comparable to those of uh, the African lions and you don't see that any inbreeding depression in their population parameters. However, if you were to look at the home ranges of these lions, the, the protected area here is marked in green. This is the gear protected area consisting of a gear sanctuary and a Gir uh, National Park and this is the area of Girnar which is a very uh, the largest the highest point in Gujarat uh, it's a granite mountain which has come up there it's, it just sticks out of nowhere on the outskirts of uh, the city of Junagadh so all this which you see here uh, in dotted is uh, uh, urban centers uh, which are occupied by high density of humans and this Girnar wildlife sanctuary has lions and Lions also venture into the city of Junagadh, as you can see from the home range polygons over here. Uh, at night, they do venture into Junagadh city with very high human densities. So these home ranges, if you if you were to compare them with the um, protected area, it's match in the size. Um, you, it's impossible to contain population of lions within the protected areas. Therefore, coexistence with humans in the la larger landscape becomes an essential conservation strategy and lions home ranges are as large as 500 to 700 in the agro pastoral 
of Saurashtra. Quality so, of how lands um, would be counted because the Gujarat Forest Department uh, uses a total count to count lands and lands in one night can travel anywhere between 30 to 70 kilometers so they can get they have the you know the chances of them being counted more than once at different locations is a reality as well as as long as you do not identify individual lands you will never know the proportion of lands that do not appear in your sample of total counts so the total counts is a sort of an archaic uh, way of counting animals nowhere in the world is it advocated by uh, animal or wildlife science it's still a very old technique which is used by the Gujarat Forest Department to count the lions uh, in, across the landscape. And uh, I don't believe that it can be relied on to come up with accurate numbers of lions in the landscape. But if you look at the, um, these are radio locations through satellite um, and GPS followed lions. So lions can lie up in small scrubbery which you see here, maybe just about a hectare. So this is about 150 meters from the closest uh, hut over here, which you can see. And the lion lying around here in this uh, uh, small hedge grow uh, for the entire day without being noticed uh, at all uh, uh, by human beings or the livestock or whatever else. At night, these lions from the agro-pastoral landscape, they actually come out and they forage uh, within villages, on the outskirts of villages, inside urban centers and so forth. So this lion is walking down the street at uh, around... Uh, uh, what's the time here? Um, it's about two o'clock in the morning. You know, the lion is in the middle of the landscape uh, of the village here, and here also you can see another lion which is inside the outskirts of this uh, city, small city. So lions are not restricted during the night in their habitat use, but during the daytime they do need refuges of some cover to lie up in, and uh, they forage um, in the urban settings and semi-urban settings at night. But they cannot breed uh, in these landscapes unless they have a minimum of about four square kilometers of habitat available. That's the smallest a lioness needs to rear cubs away from human beings. So these landscapes, which you can see here, um, the different populations here and the refuges in which there are breeding populations outside of the protected area is what I'm trying to show you. So these are the uh, kernel home ranges of the radio collared lions and they are much smaller than the minimum convex polygons and these are the core areas in which lions actually can and do breed. So if you were to look at the breeding requirements in the outside landscape, um, you see these are the breeding lionesses within the gear protected area okay? and these are breeding lionesses outside the protected area. So you need 35 square kilometers inside the protected area which is uh, got good cover, less human disturbance and a lot of prey while you need about 252 square kilometer home range for a lioness outside of the protected area. Of, uh, this is the entire home range and the core areas are also 10 times larger outside than they are inside. Interestingly, um, most carnivores are territorial and that's the case with lions as well, only for the females. The male home ranges or territories overlap substantially and what we found is that they overlap in areas where the core of female prides are uh, present in space. So if you look at this, these are the polygons are different male territories and the shaded grey areas are the core areas of female prides and wherever these core areas are, that's where the lion coalitions or lion territories of males overlaps. So several males try to have access to female prides and they tolerate each other, they fight of course, but um, it's more of a, a sort of a hostility, posturing, gesturing and once the stabilize, uh, stabilization of male territories occurs, the neighbors do not uh, kill each other or fight to an extent where they would uh, harm each other beyond repair. But um, they do overlap and, and lionesses do mate with multiple males and I'll just explain to you their social behavior in a little while. So the reason for uh, uh, this is uh, several fold. Uh, lions in Asia are probably the only ones who do this. In, in Africa, the lions uh, have single female groups to single male groups. So the coalition partners, because lions are uh, form coalitions of males, are mostly related males, either brothers or cousins. 
who take uh, residence and then they defend female groups uh, against invading males and that's what happens in Africa. In India and in the Asiatic lands, the coalition partners actually defend an area, not a female pride, but an area within which more than one group of lionesses may be present. And um, uh, these lionesses are often shared with neighboring lions. So if you were to look at this, this is a female pride uh, in the western part of Gir. Okay? And you can see that they are quite exclusive in the sense the overlap between these territories is minimal. Okay? If you were to look at the male territories in the same area, you can see a large amount of overlap in the male ranges. So these can be singleton males or coalition males. The largest coalition was operating here of four males. Uh, we had coalitions ranging from uh, well, male size. Uh, male territories were held by single males up to a coalition of four males, which you see here. But right, if you were to put these together on one on top of each other, you would have the male coalitions in the uh, in the red overlapping female coalitions uh, for uh, female prides in areas where they were intensively used by females. Right. So each female pride has one primary coalition and one to three peripheral coalitions and vice versa. Why is this? This is a female strategy to try and avoid infanticide. Okay? So as when new males come in, they, as I told you, they kill all the cubs uh, sired by the female and this is a huge loss to females who has invested a lot in reproduction and rearing of these cubs in terms of energy and in terms of time and there is very little opportunity in a lifetime to actually leave behind enough progeny to replace yourself. So this strategy um, of killing cubs is extremely costly for the female and they try the level best to prevent males from killing their cubs. So by having several males um, actually mating with females, they confuse the paternity uh, and the males of neighbors tolerate the cubs of those females thinking that they were her very own. Okay, so here you see uh, a social network okay? and the, these are females and the rectangles are males and you see that uh, this is uh, the color code tells you different prides. The larger circles represent females who were bred earlier and the smaller circles represent females who are mating for the first time. So you can see that the females of this blue pride are actually mating with three different coalitions. Okay? This coalition of two males, this other coalition of two males and another coalition of two males. While these coalitions, or the, the, the brown coalition here is mating with the blue pride as well as the green pride. While this coalition of olive green is mating with the blue pride as well as the red pride. But they are the primary males responsible for the blue pride. Okay? So there is intermixing of males and females, so on and so forth. So this utter confusion as to who the father of the cubs are. And all these males, this group as well as this group and this group will be confused as to who has sired the cubs of this pride. So none of these would actually kill the cubs in this pride. Then they would protect them from other lions who are coming in to raid and take over the territories. So the females actually fool the males into believing that all the cubs sired by the her, I mean, uh, are sired by him. There's also a discrepancy between what uh, maiden breeders will do, females, and what experienced breeders do. So this is a sort of a choice the female exper exper uh, uh, exhibits in choosing whom she's going to mate with. So the maiden females always breed with the resident males, the males who are holding, coal, uh, holding territory or majority of their area. While experienced females prefer to go out and sneak populations with the neighbors. And that's probably to enhance their genetic fitness because they've already bred with the resident coalition. They don't need to prove to them that the cubs are theirs. So they try and maximize the genetic diversity by going and meet, mating with the neighbors. Okay. The males, the sociality of Asiatic lion males differs that from the African lion males. In African lions, it's believed that all the lions in a coalition or in a group who live together share their mating opportunities and share the kills. There is no dominance hierarchy amongst the partners in a coalition. That's not the case in Asiatic lions. There's 
clear cut linear hierarchy in the asiatic alliance and we have uh, looked at this for mating opportunities as well as their feeding so the dominant male in a coalition will feed first and will get all the opportunity to mate uh, whenever there is a female in estrus so in in this if there are four males in a coalition it is mostly the first one who gets 70% of the mating 20% of the other mating goes to the second male and the remaining matings are very rarely going to the third and fourth part okay so there there is a uh, cost associated with large coalitions and recently we found out that these third and fourth ranking males in a coalition who are behaviorally subordinate to the alpha male in the coalition are actually the brothers of the alpha male so if they help the alpha male or the top uh, dominant male in a coalition to mate they are actually allowing their brother to mate and enhancing their own fitness by doing so so there is genetics involved um, it's a sort of a kinship selection in lion coalition formation so how do lions move from one area to the other what you see here is a photograph taken from the gear protected area across the human dominated fields to the uh, the mountains which form the foothills of the girnar hills okay and this is often used by lions and uh, corridors like this this agro pastoral landscape is crucial for the occupancy of lions across 1300 13000 square kilometers of this landscape dominated by humans what what we see is that this these corridors are fast uh, deteriorating with urban sprawl and infrastructure development just like what i told you about tigers and you see here how rapidly the development is removing the habitat the red is urban centers increasing uh, across the landscape and the conversion of uh, pastoral landscapes into agriculture and eventually into urban centers is happening very rapidly in the area where the asiatic lion ranges today in gujarat i'll come back to that in a little while little more on the behavior of lions so now that we have so many radio collared lions we could actually uh, look at their uh, diurnal behavior uh, in the sense of how they do what they do in time across the 24 hours and you see uh, this is the pattern of uh, activity for male lions female lions lionesses and their major prey that is cheetal and livestock so if you look at male lions they hunt in the early morning hours if you look at the hunting peak of lionesses it is during the evening hours so there is a difference between the hunting strategies of males and females this is because males often kleptoparasitize uh, parasitize the kills of females that means they steal the food which the female procures because they are stronger and they are larger so they don't like to hunt and females don't want to lose their food so they hunt in the evening when lions are uh, the male lions are least active and their activity increases as the night progresses at around 10 o'clock they start becoming active and they remain active till late morning but females start getting active early on they make their kills in the evening and they get a full almost 4 to 5 hours to actually feed without being disturbed by males coming and stealing their kill so this is a strategy which is used by lions to have a differential time budget in um, trying to minimize kleptoparasitism by males to the food habits of uh, uh, lions we see that uh, this is i'm comparing two landscape this is the outside landscape in the agro dominated agro pastoral landscape and this is a protected area of girnar within the protected area if you see uh, lions primarily fed on wild prey but outside the protected area cattle form majority of their food that's that's interesting because that's where uh, most of the cattle are and lions feed on a lot on livestock okay. so if you were to look at how lion prefer their food uh, in the preference is very different from what they do actually this is uh, depending on what they kill compared to what is available to them what they eat compared to what is available so the preference here nilgai and buffalo in uh, within the protected area means that nilgai were in short supply and they were killed more often than available in that landscape and so were the buffalo which is a domestic buffalo over here not wild buffalo in this case 
in the outside landscape the lions preferred to eat wild prey while they subsisted on cattle and buffalo but they did not prefer to eat them because they were in abundant supply available to them across the landscape so by following radio collared lions for uh, several days day and night on foot as well as through vehicle we could actually differentiate between predation events and scavenging events when you look at food habits through fecal matter you cannot tell whether the lion has actually killed this prey and eaten it or it has actually scavenged on it but when you follow lions um, through radio telemetry you can actually distinguish between when a lion makes a kill yeah or when actually it is uh, scavenging and what you see here um, is that scavenging form a major component of livestock okay uh, consumption uh, uh, when the lions were outside because in india most people do not eat beef especially in the state of gujarat cattle slaughter is prohibited and nobody is allowed to eat beef so when cattle die they are dumped uh, at certain places called hada khodis because the bone from these cattle after the scavenging is done is used uh, is very uh, very important and uh, the bone charcoal is used for purifying sugar and so on and so forth it is of industrial value so the carcasses are allowed to decompose or be scavenged and the bone is then collected for a particular industry the hides are removed for um, a leather industry so what you have is readily available meat which is thrown away in these hada kodis uh, and this is by tons and tons of kilos uh, which subsists a large amount of lions in the landscape and that's how lions are expanding without having a conflict with humans because there's super abundance of food and they actually very rarely do kill livestock uh, which you can see here scavenging forms a very important component of the diet of lions in this landscape uh, super abundance of cattle um, and also many charities uh, the cat, the cow is considered to be holy so when cattle get old or are dying and diseased and they no longer produce milk they are given to charities who take care of these cattle all panjara ports uh, the jain community especially and um, uh, these weak and dying cattle are cared for till they die and once they die they are thrown away and the lions really have a great time for, uh, feasting on these dead carcasses however these are also uh, areas which fester a lot of diseases because many of this livestock which you see are diseased and they can readily transmit uh, um, a lot of diseases from domestic stock to wild ungulates and um, dogs and also scavenge on these carcasses and dogs as you know are carriers of rabies of parvovirus of distemper and they can readily communicate these diseases to lions and currently the lions are experiencing a deadly um, uh infection of uh, canine distemper and many of these lions in the last 2 years have succumbed to this canine distemper epidemic which is ongoing in gear as we speak right now so here are uh, the maps of um, conflict with humans where lions have actually and leopards have actually killed livestock over the past 8 uh, years and these are mapped in space which you can see uh you can see the centers of urbanization which are the night lights here in both the areas but if you were to look at the pattern the pattern of predation is different in space between lions and leopards okay and these are the hot spots of predation which you see here the lion hot spots differ from those of leopards okay. the leopards this part of the saurashtra landscape is extremely fertile and rich and has a good rainfall and is uh, now a horticulture area for mangoes and for a lot of fruit and that's where leopards have taken residence and they kill a lot of livestock in this region while lions uh, are more towards the northern sites in the arid areas of the landscape and they have colonized these areas where leopards have not had a very strong foothold and you can see that uh, the conflict with leopards in this landscape where there is a high conflict with lions is relatively less so if you were to plot the conflict hot plots as contours then yeah, and uh, subsequently the leopard the hot spots you see that the, the two don't overlap there is a vast difference between the two so this tells us the extent of uh, conflict um, as the years progress the number of villages which have recorded conflict increases this is a cumulative number of villages increasing in case of conflict with lions and leopards 
in the landscape outside of the protected area. Okay. And this is the density of conflicts. That is the number of conflicts divided by the number of villages in which conflict has occurred. And if you see, uh, the conflict for leopards is almost stable, while that of lions is increasing. That shows that the lion population and density is increasing and the number of uh, conflict incidences with lions is on the rise. Okay. So this is attack on human beings. Uh, the leopard has far larger number of attacks on humans as well as lethal killing of human beings. Uh, this is human deaths in the uh, between 20, these are the, uh, the last eight years from 2010, sorry, 2011 to 2017, which is the last seven years, um, 23 human deaths due to leopards and eight human deaths due to lions. The lion attacks on human beings are rare, but recently um, we have had a couple of prides who have actually gone and sought out humans as prey and these lions had then to be removed from the system by capturing them and putting them in the zoo. So it's, it's a matter of time as lion densities increase in the landscape, uh, attacks and conflict with humans are on, likely to increase uh, exponentially. So what causes people to actually live uh, in coexistence with uh, lions despite these conflicts which are happening? And that's because of uh, um, a large tolerance and the art of living with lions within the protected area. So the, this is a, a livestock boma. Okay, There's a thorn fence surrounding it and these are the Maldaris of Gir which live inside the protected area in the Gir wildlife sanctuary. They graze their cattle there. They're, they're mostly consisting of buffaloes, even some cattle. And they're, well, they hate lions. Lions hate them as well. But there is a sort of a coexistence between them. It's portrayed to the outer world as a coexistence, but it's more of a co-tolerance, uh, co-inhabitation. Uh, the lions um, would, uh, you know, tuck their tails when they see and run from Maldaris. And the Maldaris would use slingshots to actually uh, persecute the lions whenever they are near their stock. Obviously, they don't want their stock to be killed. Uh, so, um, the Maldaris use reduces predation to a great extent. The thorn bomas do not permit lions to actually enter it and hunt. And when the lion, uh, they, um, the lions actually, uh, where they go, they take the stock out. I'll, I'll show that in the next slide. They have a particular orientation of grazing, which does not allow the lions to actually kill the prized cattle, or the prized buffaloes, uh, in the in, when out in the field grazing. But the Gujarat Forest Department um, has a very nice compensation scheme, which is quite fair and is almost close to the um, market uh, price, which pays compensation quite uh, transparently. And this prevents a backlash by the community. Uh, this was recognized by the Nawab of Junagadh, who initiated the compensation scheme, which was later adopted across India. And today, now all the forest departments across India pay compensation for tigers, lions, and other uh, large carnivores which predate on uh, livestock. However, when a lion or a leopard gets inside a corral, uh, it is devastating because uh, at that point in time, there's mass killing um, due to the milling around of livestock. And you can see scenes like this, where a single animal can kill 30, 40, even 50 livestock in one go. So what we did was we said that why, why would the uh, Maldaris continue to live inside the forest despite um, having a, you know, a problem with lions and leopards, uh, they have to be on the vigil all the time. And this is because the Maldaris who live inside the forest have free access to the forest resources. So the Maldaris who are living inside the forest make 76% more profit compared to a Maldari who lives outside the forest. And this is a large enough incentive for them not to live, not to leave the forest and come outside. And um, despite uh, the government probably offering them a good compensation to come out, uh, it's going to be very tough to move these Maldaris out because the profits associated with free grazing and free access to forest resources is substantial. And um, uh, that's why the Maldaris uh, prefer to live with the predators rather than come out uh, of the forest. So if law enforcement was not there, um, the lions would definitely suffer uh, from Maldaris living inside the forest. So if you look at the people's perception of uh, what they feel about having lions in the neighborhood, uh, living outside their doors, uh, we interviewed a lot of people from different walks of life, uh, shopkeepers to tourist operators, 
uh, to pastoralists, to agro pastoralists, and so on and so forth. And what we found was something very intriguing. So we had we can divide groups into two parts: those who do not want lions in the neighborhood, and those who prefer to have lions in the neighborhood. And we were quite uh, surprised to see that a large proportion of uh, uh, the group wanted to have lions uh, living in the neighborhood. And most of the reason given why they want lions living outside their, uh, in the neighborhood was for economic reasons. So lions are able to generate a lot of revenue for the locals and this was looked upon very beneficially by the people uh, who wanted to have lions uh, in their vicinity. So there is a lot of um, tourism associated industry with lions um, legally as well as illegally. Uh, the lions are looked upon in the agro-pastoral landscape as a predator on this crop menace caused due to the blue bull or the nail guy and the lions of course uh, predate on them but I'm not sure whether they can actually control them because the blue bulls proliferate at a much faster rate than lions can control them but it is perceived that lion predation regulates nail guy populations outside and that's why farmers like to have lions in the vicinity. There is a huge tourist industry of lion viewing which is officially um, encouraged by the forest department in the form of uh, um, vehicles like owned by the local communities, uh, lots of resorts coming up uh, in the gear landscape and uh, opportunities to see lions inside the park. Also, there is an illegal activity which goes on inside the park known as lion shows uh, outside in the landscape. Uh, I'll somehow mix this slide up but I'll just explain to you uh, the livestock grazing of the Maldaris. The prized buffaloes are kept in the center of the herd while cattle either lag behind or lead. So when a lion attacks, these cattle at the back and in the front run while the buffaloes form a cohesive herd which attacks the lion. So very rarely do lions actually kill a buffalo. If they were to kill anything, they will kill these uh, cows which are not very expensive and mostly they are not milked cattle but are young cows and cattle and calves which are kept there. So the herdsmen don't lose out a lot when lions actually attack and kill the stock. So if you were to look at this, uh, the conflict levels of uh, um, uh, high conflict area with lions, medium conflict area with lions and no conflict areas with lions. People who wanted to have lions in the neighborhood also had very high conflict with lions. This is a sort of a enigma. Why would people who are having huge problems with lions also want lions? And we had to come to the bottom of this and I'll explain to you uh, why this happens. Uh, if you were to look at this. So if you see that video, uh, all these films are taken for, uh, from by illegal lion shows. So the people living in the landscape and lions come onto the land Nobody can stop them from showing off these lions to tourists who pay a very high price to take liberties with these animals. And uh, these liberties can result in accidents both ways for lions as well as for humans. And uh, they are discouraged by the government but they are a huge source of revenue for the local public. Uh, the local people make a, lo a lot of money by uh, these lion shows. A person, a carload of people pay anywhere close to 30,000 to 40,000 for an experience like this coming from an urban center like Ahmedabad or Bombay they get to see a definite show of uh, close encounters with lions even at night you can get to feed them they can you can see them killing and so on and so forth so this is a major problem people tolerate lions because they illegally make money out of them this money is normally not shared equitably amongst the uh, different sections of the society but uh, hogged in by few antisocial elements um, who make uh, who are the dadas of that area and and make a lot of living out of them so now I'll just explain to you what is happening in the gear landscape which has permitted lions to actually survive in this human dominated landscape. So look at the predation hotspots. So these are the contour lines showing you where there are conflict with humans, uh, where livestock has been killed by lions and compensation has been paid. So these are official records where livestock compensation has been taken by the local people because the livestock has been killed by lions. 
and if you were to superimpose lion shows, illegal lion shows which occur, they coincide with these hotspots. So what's happening here? People are actually feeding their livestock to lions, making money through lion shows and also claiming compensation for the livestock that they have fed to the lions from the government. So it's a double whammy for the government. Lions are being showed to public and illegally money is being made out of them right from the government as well as from the tourists. So what has the uh, Gujarat Forest Department done? They have banned these lion shows legally. You cannot show lions like this and there are notice boards put across the Gujarat uh, Saurashtra landscape which says that if you indulge in activities like this you will be fined, you will be imprisoned. Of course it's very difficult to enforce them especially when you don't have ownership over the land. You cannot go into somebody's private land and persecute people when the lions uh, go onto them. So this is a major problem. However, this also I believe is a huge opportunity for a paradigm shift in the conservation uh, outside of protected areas. This kind of problem is now occurring across the landscape of India where lions are concerned, where tigers are concerned. When you have abundant populations within your protected area and your protected areas are too small, the only way to do conservation is to allow these large carnivores to utilize multiple use areas where people and large carnivores coexist together but in a mutually beneficial manner. And this can only happen if local people are allowed to make a profit out of it. So I am proposing that we form lion conservation constituencies. These are consortiums of village panchayats along with the forest department which enforces the Wildlife Protection Act and allows these village panchayats to actually indulge in ecotourism activities which are legal. They do not take liberties with lions but they manage their farms in such a manner so that you have habitat which allows lions to come onto them in a much better manner than what you can see uh, within the protected area. It is a win-win situation for local people as well as for lions as well as for the government which is unable to uh, stop these illegal shows. The best way to do this would be legalizing them and controlling them by making them official. Uh, the revenue which is earned from them would then be equitably shared for the social upliftment of the local community and be given to the land owner, on owner in, a, in a sort of a fee for managing his land which is in a lion uh, habitat which allows the lions to actually use that land of his. Um, so there is a incentive for the farmer to allow his habitat to be lion friendly as well. And this would stop the land conversion which is happening into uh, infrastructure development and so forth and allow lions to be occupied. So I will um, uh, skip this talk about uh, having a second home of uh, lions in uh, uh, Gujarat, the Barada Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, there is a possibility of this region which is Barada currently had lions about uh, 100 years ago uh, but now no more lions and the corridors which lead to this landscape are very tenuous. It's unlikely that lions will naturally colonize them. They could but uh, maybe a couple of lions in 8-10 years uh, can make a foray and uh, occupy that landscape but it would be better to reintroduce a proper um, uh, founding population of lions in this landscape so you have a genetic basis of uh, managing this population of lions and we have submitted to the Gujarat government to um, uh, remove people from this wildlife sanctuary which is currently occupied by a lot of Maldaris and create space for lions and this would be a second population of lions of course within the landscape of Saurashtra so not totally free of disease epidemics and so forth but it would increase the space of the expanding lions in the Saurashtra landscape. So if you were to look at this landscape uh, the, uh, the constituencies which I am proposing is because of this the conflict is on the rise and most of Gujarat, this is 1992, Saurashtra landscape, uh, satellite pictures at night and you can see how urbanization is rapidly increasing. This is the protected area of Gir, the dark area and this is the Barda landscape, the coastal forest. This is the Girnar uh, wildlife sanctuary. Those are the only areas which are left for lions to actually reside in and as time goes by, um, the world is becoming more hostile for the lions in the agro-pastoral landscape. So it's just a matter of time before retaliation comes in. The infrastructure which is coming into this landscape is extremely uh, un lion unfriendly and uh, huge mortality of lions, conflicts with lions are going to happen in the future, coming years. 
and what we are proposing for the lands future the only abode of the asiatic lands in the saurashtra landscape is going to become something like this and this is the legacy we plan to leave for the lands unless we translocate lands to barada and to the second population which has been identified and notified by the court by the highest supreme authority in this land the supreme court of india which has mandated the central government and the government of gujarat uh, in 2013 to reestablish through reintroduction a population of lions in puno wildlife sanctuary in madhya pradesh and nothing has happened in that direction till date okay so that's all latika for lions uh, maybe i can give you a couple of slides on cheetah if you're interested yes please yeah and um, 10 years ago we did this project uh, together with dr ranjit singh to bring back the cheetah in india and the reason for bringing back the cheetah was that uh, many of the arid landscapes and the grassland landscapes where tigers and lions don't occur was the cheetah was the apex uh, carnivore and many of our uh, fauna has uh, evolved under the predation pressure of cheetah the fast speed of the black buck and the chinkara is due to predation by uh, cheetah and today we don't have this evolutionary force i think we should bring it back and india has reached an economical um, economical uh, status where it can afford to do these reintroductions so the question was where can we bring in the cheetah is there space for cheetah reintroduction in india, into india or not a uh, historical range of the cheetah um, uh, and the extent rate of cheetah and where to source these populations were these were the major debates which were there 10 years ago so during that uh, in the last project which we did um, before the supreme court had intervened we had uh, uh, surveyed the desert kutch sanctuary uh, the bunny landscape the desert national park in rajasthan the shahagarh bulch which is a part of uh, the arid landscape of uh, rajasthan in jaisalmer district which uh, protrudes into pakistan uh, kuno parpur wildlife sanctuary in madhya pradesh noradehi in uh, madhya pradesh um, the uh, in chatisgarh guru khasidas national park and uh, sanjay dubri in madhya pradesh and kaimur and bagdara Uh, in Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. So these were the ten landscapes which we were we had looked into for potential for reintroduction of uh, cheetah, and we had found that the Shahagarh Bulge uh, and Puno Palpur and Nora Devi, these three areas had the potential to sustain uh, enough cheetah so that if they were maintained as a meta population, an artificial meta population, we could have a viable cheetah population in India. And uh, these this is what we had recommended. Uh, when in 2013 the supreme court passed a very important judgment for conservation for the reintroduction of lions into puno and they called the reintroduction of cheetah which we had planned to do in puno palpur uh, we had uh, animals created in namibia to be brought here we already had the cites permits but the court verdict stopped this from happening because they called it as an illegal uh, venture on the part of uh, the indian government to try to bring in african cheetah into india and the lion in reintroduction should take precedence over cheetah that's what uh, of course all conservationists agree to that no doubt about it but um, uh, lions have not yet come since 2013 uh, so uh, supreme court has reconsidered its uh, order of 2013 and has expunged the um, the order that it had uh, brought in for uh, not allowing cheetah to come in and it has now agreed to bring in cheetah on an experimental basis into india so we will be reevaluating some of these sites especially noradehi puno and uh, uh, shahagarh bulge which we had considered and even developed excellent uh, action plans also we may uh, look at the mukundra area over here um, uh, in uh, close to uh, nora uh, ranthambore which is now a tiger reserve um, whether it has the potential to uh, hold some cheetah as a staging ground uh, before they can be reintroduced into the wild so that's that's where the cheetah project is in india and uh, we hope to do this hopefully in the next coming year thank you very much sounds amazing thank you so much that was um, wonderful i would have loved to discuss more but uh, we don't have more time so um, maybe i can if there's really really important questions i'll email you and get some replies thank you so much dr jo sure, latika take care thank you
The GDP only spikes when nature is destroyed. When you cut down the forest, it makes a, an impact on your GDP.